second youngest, oldest faculty in the school. And I'm going to introduce you to you today the second oldest new faculty uh, in the school, Jack Wells, who has an excellent uh, background of practice in New York offices and Ohio offices and Indiana offices, including uh, one of the offices of Spectre in New York and Richard uh, Meyer in New York and Victor Lundy, who was one of our guest lecturers several years ago. He also was a Peace Corps volunteer in Peru, and I think it's uh, Peru we're going to uh, hear about today. Two projects that he worked on won uh, honor awards in the annual or biennial Indiana Society of Architects Awards this year. The uh, Fountain at Woodruff Place in Indianapolis and the uh, uh, motel down at uh, heck, kind of Madison, what's the state park? Clifty Falls State Park. <coughs> Very, very nice uh, project down there. Uh, I was at a meeting in the governor's office uh, today, and uh, they were passing around a nice book that was published by Historic Landmarks of Indiana, which has uh, has his drawings uh, in it, and they were shouting his praises around the governor's desk today, so that's kind of nice for one of our faculty to be praised that way. It's very nice also to have Jack Wells speaking today. Jack Wells. <coughs> The uh, <coughs> title of the lecture or essay that I'll give today is Uru Bamba, which uh, most people have been having problems uh, pronouncing, let alone knowing what or where or who it is. <coughs> Uru Bamba is the sacred river of the Incas. And <coughs> as uh, Dean Sappenfield mentioned, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Peru. And of course, Peru is the, the heart of the Incan Empire and the heart of the Incan <coughs> spirit runs through the Urubamba River. So what I plan to do is show a number of slides of the river and the areas around it, the cities that border on it, <coughs> give some idea of what it's like there and what the Incas are about as well. So, I guess we can uh, begin by showing slides and, and continue from there. adventurer named Francisco de Or Oriana first discovered the Amazon River from an unlikely direction. It was discovered from the west rather than the east. The river itself begins only 120 miles from the Pacific Ocean, and yet it dumps into the Atlantic Ocean. It's the longest river in the world. It has about 50,000 miles of waterways in it with over 1,100 major tributaries. One of these tributaries is the Urubamba River, probably the most romantic and most interesting of all of them. <coughs> the actual source of the Amazon begins in country such as this, at a place called Mount Wagra, which is close to the city of Cusco. Cusco was the ancient capital of the Incan Empire. The source itself doesn't continue through the Urubamba River, but in its sister river, the Aparimac. However, the source of the Urubamba begins such as this. <clears throat> the high mountain area where the source of the river begins is looks much like this. And one has to recall 
<coughs> that the permanent snow line in Peru is 17,000 feet. So whenever you see snow in the country, you're at a tremendously high altitude. Most all of the rivers that are formed in the country run from west to east and run through this kind of, of territory. You can uh, see uh, <coughs> small mountain villages such as this all along the route of the, of the river. <coughs> the river is important in a lot of ways. One, because of uh, its relationship to the Amazon and relationship to the Incas, but also its relationship to the Spanish uh, conquerors who came later. Uh, the Spaniards first arrived on the shores of Peru in 1532, led by a, an illiterate and illegitimate adventurer named Francisco Pizarro, and within six months had it transformed the entire Incan Empire from a very strong eight million person empire that stretched over 3,000 miles to virtually a, a fiefdom of, of Spain itself. And he did this simply by <coughs> executing the Inca, which is at the head of the pyramid of power, and everything below it just seemed, seemed to crumble below him. As I said, when you see snow, you're at a pretty high altitude in Peru. And <clears throat> one thing that determines virtually the entire country are the Andes Mountains, which run three separate ranges from north to south, three parallel ranges. And this separates the country into two, three different areas. One is the desert coast. The second is the type of territory you see here. And then thirdly, on the eastern slopes of the Andes, you go into jungle area and finally into the Amazon basin itself. The, uh, <coughs> the mountains seem to rise simply out of the, uh, the river beds themselves. And uh, along the river beds, you'll find a pretty strong agricultural activity, although up in the slopes, as you can see, the steepness of it doesn't allow that at all. There are a few plateaus, however, such as this, just beyond the tree line there, and that slight rise and drop off to the river, and in this case, a drop of about 2,000 feet, something we don't often see in Muncie. Uh, all of the trees there are eucalyptus, and eucalyptus trees are not native to South America. However, they're native to Australia. These trees were brought here uh, in the early part of this century and planted, and now there are enormous forests all over the country of eucalyptus trees. This is uh, the Urubamba River itself. As you can see here, the river is fairly straight. The only reason for this is that Incan engineers decided that the best way to take advantage of the land was move the river over one side of the valley. And being pretty good uh, in terms of geometry, they just straightened out the river. That's happened here and in other parts of the river farther up the stream as well. Another view of, <coughs> of the valley of the Urubamba. Um, that little outcropping to the left there isn't uh, unusual at all, and before this slide was taken, I was standing on top of it. So the <coughs> sense of height and, uh, and space is really sometimes overwhelming. There's a certain picturesqueness about the valley as well, <coughs> such as this view, again with eucalyptus trees. When the Spaniards arrived, and they arrived in Cusco, about year 1533, <clears throat> only about eight or nine months after they had arrived in, on the uh, shore, there were no trees in the mountains, at least in uh, this area of the mountains and on the western slopes where there's nothing at all. <clears throat> so it, 
the sight of trees nowadays is really uh, something to be thankful for, I think. You can also find this kind of terrain as part of the valley. This is at an altitude of nearly 12,000 feet, and most of the Indians live between 8 and 12,000 feet in this valley. The kinds of places they live are in villages such as this, which are built directly on the sides of, of the mountains. This is done mostly to get as much land as they can <coughs> to be used for agriculture. And since that's uh, something that's very precious, then one doesn't mind walking up uh, long flights of stairs to get home. Right? You can also find small villages like this nestled between <coughs> two larger peaks. And of course, off to the side so they can use uh, whatever land is available for agriculture again. That small river there is usually indicative of the kinds of rivers that, that run in the high Andes, such as this where this picture was taken. You can find villages like this as well, <coughs> built on the only stable land across this marshy area. And in the background, once again, the mountains just seem to spring up out of the plain. This village is over 10,000 feet, so the peaks of those mountains are really pretty high. You'll find small walled-in villages like this, <coughs> It's the uh, poor man's answer to Carcassonne, I guess. And you'll find villages like this and the edges of lakes that seem to, uh, to grow down as well as to grow up. Or high rises. <coughs> of course, uh, Coca-Cola is everywhere, and that, that becomes a big part of one's uh, social life. And villages such as this, which was built on directly on foundations of, uh, of Incan walls, and the city itself is nearly the same except for the tile roofs. The Spanish brought uh, clay tile roofing into uh, the country. Before that, it was all done uh, by thatch. Nonetheless, the layout, and even that uh, water and sewage system is, uh, is five to 600 years old. <clears throat> you find farms like this. Uh, these people were baking a large loaf of bread at the time. And, uh, <laughs> But even a small farm like this is reasonably difficult to uh, <clears throat> to maintain. And most of the farming in the highlands is done virtually the way it was a thousand years ago, and that is that small family plots uh, or clan groups uh, till very reasonably small areas of land. <coughs> and yet, also in the valley, you'll find these kinds of, of scenes, a larger village toward us, and then the road that leads to the church of the village, you'll find houses along it too. And then, of course, the rest of the land is used as used for farming. You'll find villages that sit on the edges of precipices. <coughs> Just beyond the edge there, it simply drops down nearly vertically for 2,000 feet. I guess God is kind to people sitting in church. It hasn't slid off yet. <clears throat> and this is a fairly typical scene that one might see through the uh, Urubamba River Valley. And this is as well. Most of the construction, of course, is done with adobe walls and uh, <coughs> stone foundations, as in this building, or these buildings, right? and uh, clay tile roofs. Sun dried bricks, usually clay or kiln fired clay tiles. 
the principal <coughs> city in the area and the capital of the Incan Empire is just beyond these walls and the blessing of Christ. And it's called Cusco. Cusco, at the time of the conquest, had a population of about 15,000. Today it has a population of about 120,000. And from here, virtually the entire empire of the Incas was ruled until very late, about the time the Spaniards arrived when the empire was split between two brothers and part of it was uh, ruled from Quito in Ecuador. <coughs> Nonetheless, this is the kind of terrain that <coughs> surrounds the, the principal city. And this is as well. Here we find a shepherdess and her son looking over the city as they tend their flock. And just below, this is what they see. Cusco was one of the major colonial cities as well. The city was built virtually on top of <coughs> the Incan city. And of course, it changed pretty radically and dramatically over the next 50 years from an Incan city to a European city. And yet, it's not European either. It's somewhat of a hybrid. A large church in the center there gives some idea of religious activity that's always going on in the city. <coughs> it was the uh, religious center of the Incan Empire as well as the political center. It was also a very strong colonial and modern day religious center as well. There are at least seven cathedral sized churches here and probably 40 other smaller ones. Here's a view of the main plaza of Cusco. The cathedral itself facing the plaza from the left, and another church called La Compañía facing us and facing the plaza at right angles to the cathedral. Just beyond it, you can see another one, which is Santo Domingo. Santo Domingo was a church built directly on the Inca's primary temple, the Temple of the Sun. <coughs> another one of the principal churches of Cusco. This, with its concrete uh, sidewalks and streets and electric lighting, is the modern <coughs> world that's superimposed upon the colonial and the, the ancient. <coughs> but we're never very far from the, the idea of, uh, or the presence of the Incas. You can see in this city, uh, mid-city street, to the right there is a, a, a pure Incan wall made of cyclopean-sized stones, <coughs> and each carved and molded in such a way as to, to fit its neighbor virtually perfectly. These are schoolboys out on a, on a hike. The, the city being in the mountains, of course, is a part of the mountains in a dramatic way as well, because everything except the very center of the city is built on these very steep slopes. <coughs> Another example, or closer example, of the Incan stonework. This one uh, has some fame because it's called the Stone of the Twelve Angles. But I think you can see there <coughs> how closely each of these stones fit into each other. That stone in the center is about three and a half <coughs> feet high to give you some idea of scale. About five and a half feet long and about three feet deep. So to carve that entire stone this way and every one around it to fit each other so neatly, I think is a, a real monumental task. And in no place can you shove a knife, even a knife blade between the joints of these stones. This is true throughout virtually all Incan stonework. <clears throat> the other thing that I think is amazing is that these stones are made of, of granite. They're very hard as well. On the edge of Cusco, this kind of view is, is generally seen. But within the city, you find these kinds of views. Again, an Inca wall to the left, a long flight of stone stairs, the stone and adobe walls above the, the stonework, stucco, <coughs> and 
men with, with steel sash windows. Another one that's fairly typical of the city. <coughs> and this, and the color scheme is more or less typical throughout uh, at least the western side of Latin America. Pastel colors and uh, not much relationship to the guy next door. I want to be able to uh, let your personality shine through, I guess, and put a pink wall between a green and an orange one. <clears throat> View of the roofscape of Cusco. <clears throat> and one of the, the churches that overlooks the main plaza is this one. And this one as in most of the others, was built directly on previous Incan foundations for their temples. And it was a good way for the Spaniards to eliminate the pagan beliefs of, uh, of the Indians because they believed they were there not only for conquest and uh, to enrich themselves through gold, which they did to a considerable degree, but also to convert. <clears throat> so the best way to do that is to just superimpose your beliefs over the top of the beliefs of uh, the ones you wish to convert. <clears throat> and they also did it in another way, which was clever, and that is they used certain saints' days on the very same days that the Incan Empire had feast days and, and holidays. So the same days were observed. However, the, <clears throat> the emphasis was on the Christian belief rather than on the worship of the sun. Another fairly typical uh, scene throughout the city. Nearly everywhere you go, you'll find these enormously large and beautifully done churches. This is the uh, principal plaza down close, Plaza de Armas, which was founded and laid out by Pizarro himself. <clears throat> the cathedral is to the left, and Jesuit church, La Compañía, is to the right. Nearly every plaza, I should say every plaza in the entire country of Peru is known as the Plaza de Armas, uh, which was the original name of the Plaza de Pizarro used here. Uh, Pizarro was killed by his own men only four years after the, the conquest began. <clears throat> so even though he became a very rich man very quickly and suddenly had an empire all to himself, he and Charles V. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't often pay because somebody's uh, likely to stick a knife in your back. A closer view of the cathedral. And this and uh, the church of La Compañía, which faces it, to my mind, are probably the two finest churches, in, at least among the finest churches in all of South America. <clears throat> Another view of it. This built primarily granite as well. And although the, the architects were principally Spanish, although much of the workmanship and the ideas of the workmanship was done through Indian help, uh, nearly all of the building was done through what amounted to slave labor. But the architects themselves were generally from Spain, who were educated in <clears throat> A closer view of one of the towers. Uh, nearly all of the churches in Cusco were uh, begun <clears throat> in the mid-1500s. However, there was a major earthquake in 1650, so all except one had to be rebuilt at that time. <clears throat> uh, all of the Inca buildings stood intact, however. This altar is at the main entrance to the cathedral. This is in isn't even one of the, uh, the principal altars in the church. This just simply faces the street. <clears throat> All of the legends and myths about the Spanish taking gold out of Peru, there's no legend and no myth. In fact, the gold volume of all of Europe after the conquest, the years following the conquest, doubled. And uh, the volume of, of silver 
in uh, Europe went up 25 percent. You think of all the gold that was already in Europe, that's a tremendous amount. <clears throat> of course, a lot of it stayed, and most of it stayed in the churches. Even today, Peru produces quite a lot of gold. Uh, very Baroque, Rococo in style. Churigaresque is it's called Spanish. And uh, <clears throat> another example, all of the artwork during these colonial times in Peru um, was very vital and uh, rivaled only and probably surpassed only by Mexico. The, the frames there are gold, the uh, columns that uh, support the, <clears throat> the altar there to the right are all gold. The second church that I mentioned is La Compañía, which is this one built or begun in about 15 or 1651 after the earthquake. Uh, the cathedral was actually begun in 1550 and finished about a century later, although major repairs had to be uh, done on it because of the earthquake. This is the cloister to uh, one side of the church. It's now used as the University of Cusco. And this is one of the, uh, the major altars within the, uh, the church itself. The paintings there are, uh, are date from the 17th century as well, and are known as part of the Cusco School, which was the major school of art in South America for about 100 years. A few of one of the pulpits see the, the vaulting up above there is uh, ribbed, so it's of a fairly late European style. Uh, an organ to the left of the crucifix. And one of the, this is the principal dome of um, La Compañía, again ribbed. And, uh, <coughs> dates from about uh, about 1700. The closer view of one of the cloisters, the kind of stonework that was done there, the, uh, the detailing around the arches is uh, more or less homemade in terms of uh, its Indian characteristic and influence, even the decoration of the columns. <clears throat> so the native craftsmen got to, to say something, but of course they were always under control of Spanish artists and architects. This is City Hall in Cusco, primarily a stone and stucco building and with uh, iron frames for uh, windows and then iron grills also for protection of the first floor. You'll find this throughout Cusco and the rest of the country as well. <coughs> um, whether great amounts of fever go on or not, I'm not quite sure. Nonetheless, nobody's going to take any chances with it. <clears throat> and just inside the, the city you'll find things like this aqueduct, also built from about uh, <clears throat> the middle of the, the 17th century. The domestic housing that you'll find in the city, at least from colonial times, is pretty well typified by this, which is somewhat of an atrium house, very much uh, Mediterranean characteristic, <clears throat> except it's made of, uh, of granite stone. And this house is uh, known as the house of Garcia Lasso de la Vega, who is a son of one of the conquistadores and an Inca princess. He was also one of the first to write uh, what he referred to at least as true history of the Inca Empire. Uh, there's some speculation as to whether he lived here or not. Probably not because the house was most likely built after he had left Peru and, and went to Spain, where he actually wrote his chronicles. In fact, uh, died when he was about 75 or so in Spain. <clears throat> so he was fairly well removed from the scene when he wrote his chronicles. Nonetheless, he had first-hand information having a mother who was the sister of uh, the last Inca father who was one of the uh, 
conquerors of her people. And within the house, you can still find <coughs> these kinds of things, though. This is a fairly good example from the Cusco School of Painting. Uh, some things somewhat primitive in style. Nonetheless, there's a certain vitality that I think is really uh, rather exciting. Another example here, Virgin and Child. This one's a little more primitive than the last. <clears throat> the sad thing is that many of these things, which have been part of uh, churches throughout the country for centuries, has been neglected or is being neglected, unless something's done fairly soon, and most likely all go to waste. These things will be destroyed by uh, weather and, and neglect. In terms of sculpture, you can also find these kinds of things, which uh, isn't directly from the Cusco School, but uh, probably shows in a very uh, dramatic way the uh, craftsmen of the Indians, because they were not into at least carving from stone. And I'm speaking of the Incas now. Pre-Incan cultures were into carving stone in naturalistic ways, although stylized to a great degree. And here is somewhat of a European motif carved by a native craftsman. You can count the fingers on the hand there, there's six. Probably Martian origin. <laughs> At least von Donegan would lead us to believe that. This would be more closely uh, this would more closely resemble European carving, though, which you can find throughout the city as well. This was a house of one of the earlier uh, conquistadores. This is the church of Santo Domingo that I mentioned <coughs> once before. That curved wall, the lower right-hand part, was the original Incan <coughs> Temple of the Sun. During the earthquake in 1950, the church fell to ruins. The walls of the uh, Temple of the Sun hardly moved at all. Um, I don't know what that says about the Great Spirit, but uh, nonetheless, it's interesting. At the other end of the church, you'll find this kind of tower, which is fairly typical of the era, at least in Peru. Fairly basic. <coughs> square rectangular tower and then up above just uh, all hell breaks loose. A close view of uh, another tower of another church. I think pretty exquisite stonework. <coughs> a view of the same church from a different angle. Stonework around the windows and the display is worked pretty finely. The rest of it is set in rubble. Peru, unlike Mexico, had very few of these types of towers, <coughs> uh, coxcomb types of towers. Cusco only has this one, to my knowledge, and very few other cities in the country. Inside these churches, though, they get to have pretty dramatic spaces and dramatic spaces created by the kinds of altars that are in there. This is from a convent of Santa Clara. <coughs> Most of the altar is made up of mirrors and, uh, and of course, ubiquitous gold. A side altar in the same church. Here you can see pretty dramatic fashion. They, they, primitiveness of native craftsmen in, in this altar. And of course, all of the uh, picture frames and the moldings and all of the detailings around uh, the altar itself are all done for gold. It isn't solid gold, however. It's done, the base is made of cedar, and then there's a plaster base put over that, and then powdered gold is pressed into it. Nonetheless, it's, it's pure, nearly pure certainly gives the appearance of being solid. Another of Cusco's churches, the twin tower motif was generally used, except in the smaller churches. And it's 
principal altar looks like this. The silver in the center there is solid silver. So there's <coughs> and of course statuary and, uh, and paintings in all of the niches. Uh, the monstrance in these churches are rather large and of solid gold. I know the one in the cathedral stands nearly four and a half feet high solid gold and something like over a thousand precious stones in it. The largest pearl in the world is in one of the monstrances of uh, one of the churches in Cusco. How the largest pearl in the world ever got to Cusco is beyond my imagination. But nonetheless, there it is. And yet you can find these kinds of things within the city as well. This is a, a doorway to a house and a uh, coin of the realm is up above and then designs of the realm are down the two sides of the door. Another one, this one, <clears throat> bearing the coats of arms of uh, people who erected the house. And I think uh, you can see on either side of the doorway there the way the stone work was uh, handled, that it's Incan in origin. And you can also find these kinds of details throughout the city, too. Things that make the city sort of fun and, and vibrant in a lot of ways. Little places like this, passageways which you can find nearly everywhere throughout the city. Little fruit stands. to see what the people of the city in this area look like as you start in the marketplace. And here's a man going off to market. <clears throat> they carry just about everything on their backs. Uh, weeds, refrigerators, children. So to get to the market itself, we run into a, another kind of uh, traffic jam. These, these ladies are complaining about the price of beef. Can you imagine that? I think they won the argument, too. I think our housewives aren't quite as lucky. In the market, they're usually open with the back of this. Moved over now. And at the end of the market day, you'll find this kind of scene. It's a lot of orange juice. Or you find little, little school boys waiting for their mom to come out. This lady would be typically dressed in the Cusco area, that type of high white hat, uh, the type of shawl and blanket that she carries, whatever she's going to carry on her back, usually dressed uh, with about a dozen skirts and wearing pigtails. Here's another hat that's similar. Usually, as I said, this uh, high white hat is typical of this area. Depending on where you are in the country, you can tell. If you were put down in any part of the country, you could tell where you were simply by the kind of hat that you were. Because every part of the country, even from village to village sometimes, uh, differs. Here's a lady sitting in front of one of the churches. She's about as old as the church. <laughs> There's another lady with her son sitting in front of her. Again, the same kind of hat. This gentleman, though, would be more typical of the kind of profile that you'll find that dates back from the time of, of the empire. Usually the men will wear a stocking cap with a long tail on it, such as he's wearing felt hat over that. The profile could be the same as it was 500 years ago. 
local musician. One of the local beauties. One of the uh, younger local beauties. And of course, death is always somewhere nearby. <laughs> He wasn't going to be put in the casket. He was taking that back to his village to uh, put somebody else in. <clears throat> but his dress is fairly typical, too, of villages around Cusco. That is, sandals made of B.F. Goodrich and uh, by B.F. Goodrich. A poncho, um, usually not quite that gaily colored, and again, a stocking cap. And the breeches cut off at the knees at an odd angle not from front to back, but from side to side. This <clears throat> young lady is just outside the city of Cusco. And in fact, she's standing within the great ruins of Saxaoraman, of which this is part of. And it was the great fortress that guarded the city from the north. Uh, I think you can see by this slide the type of terrain <laughs> type of activity, geological activity that's going on in the Andes, and that is <clears throat> that there's such an upsurge of force that the strata is nearly vertical in most parts. The Andes are still growing. At any rate, <clears throat> in order to sort of echo the same idea that you find here, the fortress itself takes on somewhat the same kind of appearance, except this one is man-made. It was built in three tiers. It's 1,200 feet in length, built in a zigzag pattern in all three of those tiers. And the city of Cusco is just beyond the, the ruins as we see them here. A view of one of the center sections. That stone that's at the peak of one of the uh, sawtooth <coughs> uh, projections there is over 20 feet high. Some of these stones weigh over 100 tons, 20 feet high and 10 feet in width, 10 feet in length, or in depth, rather. And they were carted here from 20 miles away. A view of one end of the, uh, the fortress. The Spanish did their best to, to try and destroy it, but as you can see, they didn't succeed very well. Closer view of some of those stones. Even here, where the stones are 10, 12, 15 feet high, <clears throat> the joinery is still as good as it is in the smaller stones, only three and a half or five feet high. These uh, stones are also made of a uh, type of granite and have this kind of joinery. from one of the upper terraces of the fortress. Originally, it had three large towers for observation. The Spanish were successful in knocking those down. However, the uh, coat of arms of the city of Cusco still has those three towers on it. But because of the, uh, the carnage of the battles that went on here between the Spanish and the Incas, the uh, coat of arms also has a ring of, I think, 12 vultures around. It's also a good place to have a, a, a lot of fun and uh, festivities. So every year at the uh, winter solstice, which is June 22nd, the Southern Hemisphere, they have uh, an enormous <coughs> uh, festivity called Inti Raimi, which is, is trying to, to keep the sun uh, from going away in the heavens. And uh, most of the citizenry dresses up as they did in Inca times. And uh, they choose an Inca for the festival when everyone has a good time. This can also give you some idea of scale a little better than the other photographs, I think. Give you some idea of the size of those stones. The fortress never worked very well against uh, the, the Spanish, however, who uh, had armor and uh, gunpowder and horses. As you go outside of the city of Cusco, <coughs> you begin to find these smaller villages and towns 
uh, here there's a sale of cabbage, and of course Coca-Cola. The sign there says things go better with Coke. What's the dripping over that cross? Uh, crosses that you'll find throughout South America, especially in Peru, will, uh, <clears throat> and this one is fairly simple, but they'll have the garments of Christ represented, and here they're represented by garments. Uh, they'll also have uh, things like the spear that pierced his side, the sun, uh, the uh, cock that crowed three times, the ladder that was used to take uh, Christ's body from the cross. All of those things are represented on the cross itself and just simply tacked onto it. And even the, uh, the hands and feet that were pierced by the nails of Christ are usually shown there as well. But here, it's not quite as uh, elaborate as many of the others. One of the, uh, the major Inca sites <coughs> near Cusco is this one of Viracocha. And uh, Viracocha is the name of one of the Incan gods. He was uh, blonde and blue-eyed, bearded. It was also one of the reasons that uh, Pizarro was so fortunate, or so easily was able to conquer the empire, is because he was blonde, blue-eyed, fair complexion, and uh, he was mistaken for the god Viracocha. So if you're known as a god, you can do all kinds of things before people start to catch on. Uh, even today, in the southern part of the country, as I wandered around, I was often called Viracocha because the idea of fair skin, blue eyes still carries over. I didn't feel godlike uh, for the most part. It was nice being thought that way once in a while. <clears throat> this is the parish church, which is built next to the ruins in the same city of Viracocha. This dates from a very early age, too, probably uh, the beginning of the mid uh, 17th century. Another parish church that you find just virtually everywhere. Or this one on top of a steep hill. And uh, of course, modern age has come to the, uh, the highlands of uh, Peru. Here they're fixing it. Attractive. Of course, a little jug over the side is filled with some goodies too, so. They had fun fixing the tractor. This uh, doorway is simply a portal for one of the uh, colonial houses in the, in the city. This city is called Maras. And uh, it built probably around uh, 1700, but more or less abandoned uh, after that. And now it's just simply a small little house behind a very fine doorway. However, near the, the town of Maras, you'll find this, which is the salt mine, known as Las Salinas. And uh, it's in a ravine <coughs> that drops down to the Urubamba River, which you can see in the upper right part of the, the photograph. And the Incas built terraces here. And there's a very saline stream that comes out of the side of the mountain. Water is led into each of these uh, terraces and ponded, dammed up, and then within three to four weeks, uh, through evaporation, they had pure salt. A little closer view of it. Uh, this still serves as the principal uh, place for, uh, for salt throughout the, the whole southern part of the highlands. And Ruins, which have been 
known as amphitheaters for a number of years. There are five of them. Uh, one is horseshoe shaped, one to the upper left. There are two that are uh, just sort of semicircular, such as the one to the upper right, and then there are two that are also uh, circular in form. The reason that they've been called amphitheaters is because the acoustics are so perfect here. But <clears throat> the terraces are so large and the distances across them so great that probably they weren't used for any kind of performances at all. Another view of them. These, as you can see, are still being farmed. But it is a fact that the acoustics are, are really quite exquisite. The height of each of those is about 10 feet, too. And throughout the, the Urubamba Valley, you'll find colonial haciendas still being used, such as this one, near another Incan city called Piquillacta. <coughs> another view of it. Built uh, during the seven, early 1700s. And then the local parish church. Bell Tower, sun-dried adobe brick for construction. This town is uh, named, named uh, Chicheros. Uh, and it was a, an important Inca center as well. And the Spanish colonial uh, builders built on top of it. And you can uh, see in the foreground Inca stonework in the back. The tower is obviously a European uh, Spanish design. <coughs> Chicharos is a, a town that uh, Dennis Hopper, if you recall, was one of the uh, principals in uh, Easy Rider, decided to make a movie here and uh, they very nearly destroyed the town, unfortunately, both economically and otherwise, as the people of uh, <coughs> uh, very much enjoyed bargaining for. Uh, bargaining in the marketplace, 
However, the people from Hollywood uh, didn't quite understand that, so that got to be a problem. Plus, their behavior got to be a problem in a, a city that's almost untouched by the outside. And uh, I think that uh, the days that I was in this town, I was lucky people were in a good mood. Uh, there was only one person in the entire town that I found that thought that uh, Dennis Hopper or anyone from Hollywood was uh, a fine person at all. And that's only because Hopper gave him a cowboy hat. <coughs> this is a, a typical detail of uh, a building in that area. I, I think it's, well, I'm not crazy about powder blue. I think it really works to very good effect here. <laughs> Throughout the uh, Urubamba region, you can also find these nice little silver blades, too. This is my Ingmar Bergman shot. Harvest time. Not quite like the plains of Indiana. Harvest time is pretty difficult, to say the least, but so is planting time. And this is a fairly good example of the way they go about it. Except in the even smaller plots that you find around the towns and villages, where most of the plowing is done with a long stick with a metal <coughs> spade on the end of it, and everything is dug up by hand. Hand and foot, that is. One of the problems about agriculture in the highlands here is because people generally don't understand much about uh, uh, modern techniques of farming. And you can see in the background on the side of the mountain there, furrows and the plots going uh, virtually vertical. That's not the very best way to, uh, to work contour farming. And in the <coughs> foreground here, the furrows are very deep and far apart. And that's not the very best idea either. The only compensation that I can understand is that uh, the soil is very clay-like and difficult to farm anyway, so uh, I guess the effort is made in different ways. Uh, these lovely animals are Hermijamas, and uh, Obamas as we would call them. And they're the principal beast of burden in the country, domesticated thousands of years ago by the Incan ancestors. They're pretty smart animals, however, if you uh, overload them a little bit, and they'll carry up to about 75 or 80 pounds, they'll just simply sit down and won't move. So you have to take something off the back. And it's, it's about okay. uh, weaving, which has always been a, a great tradition in, in Peru <coughs> for the past two or three millennia, uh, still persists, especially in the highlands. Probably the, the finest woven goods ever made were done in, uh, in pre-Columbian Peru, especially along the coast where cotton is very fine. Here in the Highlands, of course, they use wool, uh, primarily sheep and occasionally alpaca. Uh, many of the homesteads look like this, however. But even though uh, it's not a uh, candidate for House Beautiful, the, the, how, the hats are still uh, of, of the finest quality. Uh, some of the churches in the area are very handsome as well somewhat primitive compared to uh, the great churches of Cusco. A typical street scene among the villages along the Urubamba River. Uh, Pension Yusta is a, uh, not quite your European uh, Pension. Yusta is a, an Incan word, or Quechua word. Quechua was the language the Incas spoke. In fact, Six to eight million people in the Andes still speak it. Yusta was uh, the, the chosen ladies of the Incas, uh, somewhat like the Vestal Virgins. It's also a good name for the cat. Another typical street scene. The, the walls are fairly uh, uninteresting, and all of a sudden you have a burst of color in doorways or balconies. 